This podcast is sponsored by the book Backyard Farming on an Acre More or Less. Whether your goal is to eat healthier, save money, live more sustainably, or a combination of these, Backyard Farming helps you get there. Comprehensive and detailed, it covers everything you need to know to plan, purchase, plant, raise, harvest, preserve, and enjoy your own backyard farm. You're listening to the Mom Prepares Podcast, a feature of momprepares.com, which is a modern guide to self-sufficiency and a place to learn how to keep your family safe, fed, and healthy. Hello, this is Jendi, and I am here with Joette Calabrese from joettecalabrese.com, and she is an expert on homeopathy and has several courses coming out that I believe our listeners would be very interested in. So hello, Joette. How are you? Hi, I'm very well. Thanks for inviting me, Jendi. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, certainly. Um, I'm an American homeopath. I'm a public speaker and an author, and I've studied and practiced homeopathy for about 27 years. Um, But I was not always a homeopath. I raised my children and homeschooled them for 15 years while studying to become a professional homeopath. And um, I also made all my family's foods from scratch and raised chickens and ducks, and we have bees and Uh, We have a pond, and so my children are all grown now. They're adults and away from the home. But um, I raised my children solely with homeopathy. Uh, They just never got an antibiotic, never had a Tylenol, not even an aspirin. And my oldest is 27, and we have two others uh, just under his age. And they've never had any drugs at all because I counted 100% on homeopathy and homemade foods and some botanicals as well. Um, I have been very involved with Weston Price Foundation. I'm on the honorary board of the Weston A. Price Foundation, and I'm a professional speaker and uh, and present at many of their international and regional conferences. Um, I'm also um, I've spoken and um, uh, internationally and have uh, authored uh, uh, not only my own blog where I try to give. Um, mostly women, I, I skew towards moms because I feel very strongly about what I was capable of doing with my education. And I want to be able to share that with others. I think for me, when I became a mom is when I became much more interested in what I was putting in the body. Like before that, I didn't think about it for me personally. And I love what you said about that, about antibiotics. One time I took my child to the doctor, I think, for an earache, and they gave him antibiotic, and they said, well, that's not really going to take it away. You're going to have to come back and get something else. And I was kind of like, well, then why do I want this? Right. Good you, question. Yeah. Yeah, we have to, we want, we want, I, what I want to do with moms is I want them to question the the authorities. Um, and not just, um, you know, once once you homeschool your children, for example, you can't help but start questioning other traditional um, methods of raising children. Once you step outside of one box, you can't you you can't help but note that boy that's not right either and maybe I should check this out maybe I should look into this instead of that and it just snowballs into a lifestyle that is pure and um, noble as far as I'm concerned. So how how did you first get interested in homeopathy? Well, I went to a lecture offered by a doctor, an MD. Oh, about 27 years ago, and he was traveling through my hometown of Buffalo, New York, and he was giving a lecture on vaccines, and uh, and I was pregnant with our first son, and I went to the lecture to learn a little bit about vaccinations, and uh, because I wasn't sure. I'd read a little bit and just wasn't certain about it, and I had no idea that this man was also a homeopathic physician, and so when I went and listened to him, I was astounded by the numbers and his data and the information that he gave this small band of mothers in regards to um, how every single illness that vaccines are supposed to protect us against. There's a homeopathic medicine that's been used for close to 200 years that has been shown to be even more efficacious. I was blown away that night. And Um, I went home and told my husband about it and was very excited. And I bought a book, a simple homeopathy book and a little homeopathy kit, which meant that I had a number of remedies that I could use if something happened to someone in our family. And then this book to help me determine it. And um, and then I went and met with a pediatrician to, you know, to determine who I was going to have as my pediatrician for my child when he was born. 
And I told the pediatrician that I was thinking about um, the idea of vaccination and that I, we were considering postponing vaccinations or at least maybe minimizing the number in the very beginning and slowly adding them. And he kind of rolled his eyes a little bit. That should have been my first clue, but it wasn't. I wasn't savvy enough at that time <laughs> to pick up on those nuances. But he rolled his eyes, and um, and all my friends told me, "Oh, he's a great guy. He's very open-minded," which was another clue I should have heard. I should have um, listened to because when you hear open-minded, that's not what you want. We don't want an open-minded doctor. We want a doctor who really gets it, not someone who will consider. No, no, you want somebody who's already done the homework. Um, so my son was born and I took him for his well baby checkup. That was mistake number three now, okay, because there was nothing wrong with him. He was well. What did I need a doctor to tell me that he was well for? So um, I foolishly did that and in uh, trotted the nurse with a little vial and tossed it in my son's mouth. I said, what was that? She said, oh, just his polio vaccine. Now, he was six weeks old. He was as healthy as can be. He never had anything wrong with him. He had been nursing vigorously. He was the right weight. And there was nothing I could say. There was nothing I could do. I said, well, I guess that's the way it went. I decided, though, I was pretty disturbed by the fact that they didn't recognize the fact that on my chart, it was very clear that we were going to postpone and we were going to talk about it before, et cetera, et cetera. And no one bothered to do that with me. And um, I went home um, deciding I am not going back to that pediatrician. Well, two days later, my son got very, very sick, 105.5 fever. He was listless. It lasted for two and a half days. Um, and I said, I am not going back to that pediatrician because I know what he'll do. He'll want to put him on an antibiotic and Tylenol. And I will be down the road that I did not want to travel ever in my life. And he was only six weeks old. That would have been just the very beginning. So I had this book, this homeopathy book, and this kit, and nothing in the book indicated where to go with something such as vaccinosis or injury from vaccine. But what it did have was a chapter on high fevers. And so I can't tell you precisely why I chose the specific remedy that I chose. It was an embryotic decision, but I decided to use the remedy sulfur-30. And I bet when my mother was with me, my close friend was with me. They could see how sick my son was. He was laying in my arms, lethargic, um, dry. He looked all dried out. I was there. Later, I realized I should never have, have been without forcing some kind of fluids. And he probably should have been in, on an IV. He was so sick um, to get at least saline solution. But I lucked out. And I put the pills for a little sulfur 30C. That's, that's a homeopathic remedy directly into his parched little mouth. And honest to goodness, Jendi, it was less than 40 minutes. He became firm in my arms. He began, com he commenced nursing and the fever was completely gone. I was flabbergasted. My mother said, what just happened? My friend said, holy cow, this is amazing. And that's what turned me. I said, I must learn about this medicine. I must know what this is. Had I gone the other route, he would have had an antibiotic, like I said, and Tylenol. Tylenol is very dangerous for the liver, especially a little baby's forming liver. Antibiotics ruin the gut, and, and even long term. I'm not talking about even if you give him probiotics. You, it takes a long time to undo what antibiotics can do to a baby's, to anyone's gut for that matter. And I found the answer myself in this book. I did it. I cured my son. I can't tell you the pleasure that I had in having accomplished that. So I got every book I could find, and there were not very many. We're talking back in the 80s. There were not very many books. So I dug and dug until I found a woman who had studied homeopathy in England because homeopathy was not has not been big in this country since the 1940s. It's very big in Europe and England and Germany, France, Switzerland, Greece. But um, she had studied there and I begged her. She did not want to do this, but I begged her to teach me and a, and a band of mothers how to do this so that we could treat anything that came our way. And we studied for four years. We met every Thursday night, studied for four years. And finally, I decided to go to school in Toronto. And that's, the rest is history for, for my life. Wow. 
no more <laughs> antibiotics or, or vaccines after that. Well, he never had the antibiotic, and he certainly never had another vaccine, for, and we never went back to those those pediatricians. Now he's he's a um, 27-year-old man and as healthy as can be, rarely ever gets sick, and if anything, it's very mild. You know, it's a little cough once every, you know, four years or something. So And so then I raised our other, our subsequent children um, in the same fashion, and um, and we just lived on the foods that we grew and the and the homeopathic medicine that um, that I was learning about consistently. So if our listener doesn't know what homeopathy medicine is, how would you explain it? Okay. Well, most people think that the that homeopathy means home remedies because of the prefix home in the word. But it doesn't mean that at all. Home in the word homeopathy actually means homonym or like or similar. And pathy, of course, means pathology or illness. So it means similar illness. So let me give you an example. Let's say we get an onion and we chop it up. And most folks, when they're exposed to an onion, will have a cluster of symptoms. Their eyes might run, their nose might run, their upper lip might excoriate, and they might even become a little jittery. So that is a cluster of symptoms associated with the gross exposure to an onion. Now, let's say there's someone who says, every spring when the tree buds blossom, my eyes run, my nose runs, and my upper lip excoriates, and I'm a little bit jittery. That's also, that's a similar cluster of symptoms as what an onion will cause in the gross form. But it's not exact pathology, it's homeo or similar pathology, because the difference is, in the first scenario, the cause of the eyes running, etc., is as a result of being exposed to an onion. In the second scenario, the etiology or the cause of the illness is as a result of being exposed to tree buds blossoming. So, in a homeopathic pharmacy, regu- I might say parenthetically regulated by the FDA, so this is not underground, but in, in a homeopathic pharmacy, the pharmacists get a drop or a tincture, a drop of onion that, or, or a, um, a juice and in alcohol, so now it's called a tincture, and they dilute it many times. They dilute it and dilute it and dilute it. So when I said that I used sulfur 30 for my son, it was sulfur, in that example, diluted 30 times. In the onion example, we might dilute that 30 times. And C or X after it means that it's been diluted to the hundredth or the tenth power. So it's quite dilute. At a certain point in dilution, homeopathy, excuse me, the original substance becomes curative. It might cause illness in its original form, causes symptoms such as eyes running, nose running, etc. But after it's been diluted a number of times, and it's a mathematical number, once it gets to a certain level, the toxicity is minimized and the curative aspect of the onion or whatever plant or whatever mineral we're using comes to the fore. So for that person who has the tree bud blossoming allergies, if we give them homeopathic onion that has been highly diluted, and of course we don't come up, we don't use onion, we don't use that as the name, we use the Latin name because this is medicine. So we use the name Allium sepa, which means onion in Latin. And then it tell, gives us a number as to how many times it's been diluted. We give that to that person with the tree bud blossoming allergies, and it uproots the allergy. It uproots it. doesn't treat symptoms. It gets rid of it. It's done. We're done. I'm not saying one dose. Sometimes it needs to be repeated over a period of days, and depending on the severity of the allergy for that person, it might be weeks, could even be a couple of months. But when it's done, it's generally done. Now, we might find that two years from now, when the tree buds are blossoming again, that person might again have that problem, but it will be a much less, a lesser level. It, they'll, they won't suffer nearly as much. It will last for a shorter period of time. So then they use the Allium sepa again, and it goes even deeper. So it's almost like pulling up the weeds in the garden. The, each time you see the presentation of the weed, if you pull it up by its roots, you might find that there's a little bit of a root left behind, and the next time around it'll be a weaker level of that dandelion. That's what homeopathy is. So I warned you. 
<laughs> no, that's I warned you, Jendi, I told you it's a long explanation, <laughs> particularly because most folks still believe that it means, oh, it means vitamin C or using home remedies or taking, you know, raw honey and vinegar, you know, for indigestion or something like that. And, and all of those have validity, but that's not what homeopathy is. It is a very specific medical paradigm. And I might also add that I think is rather interesting is that um, homeopathy was very big in this country at one time. We had, the homeopaths had 100 hospitals in our country um, at about in about 1940. And at the same time, the conventional doctors had fewer hospitals. The homeopaths were bigger and more impressive hospitals. There were more home. There were many. More, there were not more homeopaths than the medical doctors. There were about 40 percent of the doctors in this country were homeopathic physicians. But there were more hospitals, and they were the big, big important hospitals that you still see all around. You don't see that they're they're no longer homeopathic. Um, but there was uh, it was very big in this country. And then um, we had an uh, an infighting in medicine back in the 1940s, and it was um, abolished in US and Canada as again not so in Europe South America India just North America Is it coming back at all I think it is coming back I I don't um I don't I believe that the way it's going to come back is grassroots this time although it was grassroots last time too it was mothers who brought who wanted to home, wanted to learn homeopathy wanted to be able to use it for their families because they were tired of the same old stuff we're tired of today the antibiotics, and at that time they didn't have Tylenol, but they certainly had aspirin. They didn't want to see their stomachs all turned inside out from aspirin poisoning. They were tired of the old ways, and they wanted something that was um, gentle but very, very effective. And that's the description of homeopathy. Yeah. Like for you personally, do you take something from your homeopathic medicine every week, or is it just kind of like when you get sick? Well, if it's something that is an acute, such as a um, an ear infection, for example, then you would just take it for a few days or up to about, you know, less than a week, and it would be resolved. And then the next ear infection that had been historically repeated, like you said earlier, um, every every couple of months, it can happen again and again and again and again. No, it puts, it, it aborts it. It stops the whole process because the body doesn't need to, to, to show that any longer. But if it's something that's chronic, like allergies or food intolerances or um, long-term illnesses like arthritis, um, uh, behavior problems in children. Now we have to use it for a longer period of time. But again, there are no side effects. No side effects. Can you imagine a medicine that only does good and no bad? We didn't even know there was such a thing, did we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always with the end goal to completely stop taking it. It's not like some medicines yes. you get yes. on, you're just on forever. But this That's medicine right. is to finish and be done with it. That's right. Precisely. Precisely. That's exactly how it works. And at the very root, it is all natural substances. Well, it comes from, from plants, animals, minerals, elements on the periodic table. There are close to 6,000 homeopathic remedies that are made today. Um, it is... The difference between homeopathy and botanicals or herbals um, is that homeopathy utilizes things that in nature that are toxic because you can, because it's so dilute that it eliminates the toxicity and allows the curative aspect to come to the fore. So we can use something like poison ivy. So herbalists can't use poison ivy. It's too toxic. But if you get poison ivy, uh, the plant, and get a drop of its juice and put it in alcohol. Now, we've made the tincture, like what I said earlier, with the, with the allium sepa, and dilute it, and then dilute it again and again and again and again. Say, for example, 30 times to the 100th power. It's called Rus tox. That's the Latin name for poison ivy. 30C, for example. And we use that for chicken pox. Why? Because poison ivy acts just like chicken pox, pustules, itching, oozing, restlessness. It's the same picture. So it's homeopathology. It's similar illness, but it's similar enough that, it's, that it will resolve it, and, but not exact. 
Because if it was exact, then you would have to get chicken pox pustules and dilute them and give them to the child who has chicken pox. No, no, no. We use similar illnesses. It's quite elegant. It's simple and intelligent. Yes. It's like, oh, that makes so much sense, but oh, wow, there's so much more to it. <laughs> there is more to it. But, and, and, and many teachers of homeopathy, and I will, I, will, I will be honest with you, I too, and I've taught at colleges and universities and online and um, at seminars, and I do presentations all over the world. And I used to teach that it is extremely complex. And then I realized, it took me a long time, I'll be honest with you, Jenny, it took me a long time to realize this, that there is a way to do this for chronic issues that's very easy for, for moms and families to learn. And that's what I'm teaching now, how to do this very simply with simple protocols. And you teach this through your website, right? Yes. The, yes, we, I have I have CDs and and books that I have authored uh, that are available on my website. But right now we're we're running a course um, called Good Gut Bad Gut, um, and and you can go right to the to the front page, click on the image for Good Gut Bad Gut, and it gets folks to learn a little bit more about it. And the reason I call it Good Gut Bad Gut is because um, because of my nutritional understanding, um, and because I'm so very much against the use of antibiotics in most illnesses, particularly child, normal childhood illnesses. Um, I find that um, people are gravitate towards me who have had problems with their children or themselves having been put on antibiotics. And we find that the, that the ills that come from having used them, even one round of it can do this, uh, are not just about the gut. It doesn't just disorder what's happening in the gastrointestinal system, but it also... Um, changes children's personalities. We see ADD in children. We say, see behavioral disorders. We see uh, moodiness and fogginess in adults as a result of uh, antibiotic poisoning. We see arthritis in older people. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on, and I, and, I, and I go into all of that. So what I teach is how to uproot all of those issues in this good gut, bad gut course on my website. And that's all centered in the intestinal area. Yes. You know, sugar addictions yeah. and menstrual issues. And I'm just looking at some of the constant chronic bloating, food intolerances. If I don't get one call by, by noon every day regarding food intolerances, that's an unusual day for me. Most people suffer. Uh, they can't have wheat. Yeah. Why, can't we, why can't people eat wheat anymore? I mean, wheat was, has been around for thousands of years. For goodness sakes, Jesus broke bread that way. Why can't we eat wheat? Well, some people say it's the kind of food that's been grown. And I, I will concede that it is a lot of the food is, is industrialized and is difficult to digest. Nonetheless, we can digest it until we have the antibiotics. And then it's almost like a timeline. We can say, you know, I've not been well. I've been bloated and sh have sugar addictions, et cetera, et cetera, ever since last December. And then my question is, what happened in October or November? Oh, I had a sinus infection. Oh, really? Let me guess what you took. And now that sinus infection that was a short-term acute illness that had it been even left alone, I'm not saying that you would leave it alone, but had you left it alone, it might have lasted perhaps three weeks, two weeks. Um, now it's become a chronic illness because of the treatment that was used to uproot a sinus infection. So what I teach is, what do you do if you get a sinus infection? Let's, let's learn a homeopathic remedy so that you can uproot it and you don't have to think about antibiotics. But if you've already taken them, now what do you do? So I approach it from, from the very beginning, the beginning thinking process and all the way to the end when we perhaps have already done damage because it can be undone. And I've seen it many, many times. Because the body can heal itself if you give it yes. what it needs. Absolutely. Absolutely. But not if it's been poisoned. Sometimes it can't be done on its own. And even with probiotics, they can be helpful here and there, but it depends on the person. Some people, a probiotic can make all the difference in the world and they can get back on their feet. But what if it's a child who's had an antibiotic? Let's say my son had been given an antibiotic at six weeks old. 
and then he had another bout, another high fever or ear infection, he would have had another one and another round and another round and another round, another round. By the time, you know, then maybe he had acne when he was 18. And then by 21, he had another, he had a sinus infection. Now, how can we possibly expect that poor body to be able to respond properly after it's been poisoned so many times? Can't, it's very hard to do that without the help of high quality food, which is also, of course, important, but particularly with homeopathy to uproot that. Do you have an idea of cost? You mentioned something about you got you bought a kit when you first started, and then you said there's the FDA pharmacies. Are are you buying the medicines, or are, have you gotten to the point that you make them? And is there a lot of cost involved? Well, I I don't make homeopathic medicines generally speaking, but I do teach it in my I'm going to be teaching it in my survivalist course using homeopathy where who knows if we're in a in a in a storm or there's a catastrophe of some sort, one may need to make a homeopathic medicine and so I do teach that. But for everyday use, given that we're living in a comfortable world and things are not at that level, um, then I urge people to buy these remedies. You can buy them in health food stores. You can I, buy, I sell a kit in, out of my office where there are 100 remedies and it costs about 200. I'm going to take a, 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 an approximation. I believe it's about $255 for 100 homeopathic remedies that are very commonly used in everyday um, uh, family care. Um, you can get them at Walmart. You can get them at drug stores. Um, just watch for them. They have uh, they have uh, homeopathic remedies for teething, for uh, sleeplessness, for restless legs, for muscle cramps, um, etc. They're uh, they're ubiquitous. I mean, you can find them most anywhere. Now, when I work with a, someone one on one as a client, then I um, um, arrange for a pharmacy to for them to work with a pharmacy that that um, makes them the remedies specifically for that person. But it's unnecessary that you don't have to go that far in order to get the kind of uh, reaction that you want. Just by having a kit or getting to Walmart or a health food store, Whole Foods, they all carry them. That's so interesting because you said about the hospitals not doing it and the not being so popular anymore, but we can go anywhere and actually get them. So there's not the education. Yeah, the education is now in the hands of the mothers. That's the bottom line. It's not in the education of the doctors. They've stopped doing this. Um, there are no more homeopathic medical schools in this country. So um, I had to, that's why I had to leave this country in order to study this. And so now there are homeopathic schools that are starting up again. There's the American Medical Homeopathic School in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I'm a, on the faculty of that school. But it's... Um, um, they're they're far and few between, whereas they used to be in every you know two or three of them in every large city. So it's now it's not the doctors who are who are doing this. Uh, although in many of the courses that I give online, it's jam packed with nurses, and we do see doctors too. I have doctors who join my classes, but for the most part, you're not going to find any doctor who knows what this is, um, who's who's staying within the guidelines of what he was trained to do in medical school. He's going to have to, or she's going to have to step outside of the box in order to um, to have uh, gone this far and learned another medical science. Yeah, and you you mentioned you sell a kit, and it, can they get that through your website too? I don't sell it on my website, but if they contact me through the website, either through contact or they can call my office, we sell them directly out of my office, yes. And you said that's a hundred different remedies? Yes. And about how long would that last an average family? Well, um, I work with very large families often. I work with a lot of homeschooling uh, folks, and um, a lot of families have, you know, as many children, and these kits can last for many years. Now, I find that in I own a kit. I own a couple of different kits, but I own one kit in particular, my favorite, which is the one I sell um, to people who are interested. Um, I've owned mine for 19 years. Oh. And so I raised three kids. My husband um, has used it. We have a dog, a cat chickens. We've used it on our chickens. We used to have goats. We used it on our goats. Um, and so, uh, and these, this kit will last, I'll probably be able to pass this down to my great grandchildren because the remedies never go bad. They don't have stale dates. They don't go bad. I actually have, I, if, if, you know, if we were alive and where you could actually see me on this, I'm going to point to a, a shadow box that I have up in my office here with remedies that were given to me by a 
man who was in his 90s when he came to see me about 15, 18 years ago. His mother was a homeopath in Chicago, and she, and he had some of the remedies that she had still left over from her practice. She was an MD. And he gave them to me, and some of them are from 1910, 1918. And just to be certain that they worked, I used them for my family, and they worked. They still worked. So they're a century old almost, and they still are effective. So in a survivalist setting, I can't think of a better kind of medicine to have on hand. If you compare that to the cost of antibiotics, it's way cheaper. Oh, it's infinitely cheaper. You know, meeting with me as a consultant one-on-one is not inexpensive. I'll be honest with you. But that's why I write this blog that I that I write every week is so that I know that people can't afford to work with someone one-on-one all the time. So I write a free blog that is skewed directly towards mothers and their everyday issues. So I deal with uh, um, breast infections and uh, teething problems and uh, croup. And um, I've written about and what the remedies are, what to use exactly the precise remedies, the protocol, exactly how it's to be used, and where to purchase it. So I have a little um, a link back to someplace on Amazon or someplace else where we know that they can purchase these remedies. So they don't have to go running around Walmart or Wegmans or wherever in the country to try to find these. Yes, and I saw you had a sign-up thing they, that you could get a free first aid chart or something, like a very right. simple one. And then you said you have courses – Yes. And those are probably a little more cost effective than the one-on-one consulting? Yes, of course. Absolutely. And so these are all online courses or their CDs or their downloads. I have I have it in every format possible. No one has to travel to Buffalo, New York to study with me. They can do it all. Uh, and we also have live forums at all times. We have students who are constantly studying and asking questions and we're always there to answer questions. So That's it's awesome. Um, so there's yeah. a lot of ways they can learn through your website and can you, you said you have the bad gut, good gut course, and you have the survivalist course? Yes, that's coming up, yes. And are those the two main ones? Are there more? No, we have another course that's going to be coming up that's called Just Skin, and it's all about anything on the skin, including chicken pox, but it can also be psoriasis or warts or skin tags, um, um, acne. Um, so I'm going to be teaching just about skin. So that's another one. We've got another one that we're, that's now in the works that my writers and I are working on called Feminopathy, all about women and homeopathy. And <laughs> start, it's not even women. It's actually starting at birth, baby, young girls, all the way through to old age. And what remedies are best used for each of the maladies that, that uh, uh, a, a girl or a woman might encounter. Uh, we also have, what are the other ones? I said survivalist. There's good gut, bad gut. We just finished. Oh, How to Cure Yourself and Family, which is another very important book. Teaching. um, That's the goal. That is my goal is to teach families how to cure themselves. So if our listener is brand new to this topic but intrigued, what would you recommend that they do or start? The first thing that I would do is go to my website, Joette Calabres, J-O-E-T-T-E, Calabres, C-A-L-A-B-R-E-S-E, Joette Calabres dot com, and um, sign up for my blog. And it's free. No one ever badgers you. There's no advertising on it. I'm doing this just to get the word out. Um, You'll get a blog every week. It'll be specific to the needs of most families. Um, even though I direct everything towards moms, to be honest, um, I know that dads are interested in these things too, because I talk about shin splints and tendonitis and frozen shoulder and, and a lot of athletic issues, um, that men might suffer from, but more often than not, it's about children and families in general, the cold Ebola. uh, I've covered that as well. So, um, that's a good place to start. And once you're in learning about that, I guarantee T, you're going to be hooked like I got hooked. I guarantee it. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm going to go sign up for it because I'm intrigued already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, thank you, Joette, so much for taking the time to talk to me and our listeners today because I know you're busy with lots to do. And you know so much about this. I can tell I barely 
scratched the surface of the Oh, topic. we could go on like this forever, Jendi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go have to dive into that vlog there. Yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks again to our sponsor, Backyard Farming on an Acre, more or less. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend and leave us a good review. We always appreciate them. Our Mom Prepares community really is a great community, and we'd love for you to connect with us on Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a show. Visit our website, momprepares.com, for show notes and more great information.